discerning of spirits. We are in the series of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm not going to read that particular scripture, but you will find it in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. The discerning of spirits is one of the manifestations of the gift of the Holy Spirit. And realize that when you become born again, you receive the Spirit of God. Pastor taught us that. We understand that. One of the most prolific messages on the baptism of the Holy Spirit that I've ever heard was preached by him just a few weeks ago. Pastor, that was amazing. Understanding the gift of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was powerful. But realize that our strength as believers is our relationship with the Holy Spirit. To hear his voice, to discern his voice, to know that his strength is the core of our life. And the giftings, the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge that we heard uh, already from this platform. And by, by the way, Pastor Zach and Pastor Jason, great messages. I'm writing notes and I'm going to preach those someday. And I'll even give you credit for the message, you know, but just a tremendous job. But let me give you a definition. The discerning of spirits means this. It is the seat of emotions and character. The seat of of emotions and character, the soul. And it's from a Greek word which means to distinguish. So to discern a spirit, the spirit which is the emotions or the seed of it and the character. So discerning meaning to distinguish. So there's a distinguishing ability to go into our seat of emotion and our character and bring clarity to it. That's what the, distingui- the, the discerning of spirits is all about. So the seed of our emotions and our character. Out of those two areas of our life is a script that we live. The script that is handed to us is often from the dark one, the enemy himself. He does this by uh, creating in our lives trauma or abandonments or rejection or hurts or dysfunction. Now, I'm not going to ask anybody in here to raise your hand if you've had some form of dysfunction in your family's history, because we'd all be like, yep, that was me. Because you have to understand something. There is no perfect family. Every family is broken. Every family has been fall, has, has fallen. And so we all come through this, and that family of origin has an impact on how we live our life. Our cultures have an impact on how we live our life. I was raised as a Hungarian boy. My mom and dad, my dad was an Ellis Island immigrant at age 12. He came in to America, went into the coal mines a week later, couldn't speak any English, had a third grade education, and uh, that was my father's history. You see, we have a uh, origin of our family that impacted us because my father at 12 with no parents and just uh, relatives that he went to live with in Pennsylvania, grew up based on what he learned from his traditions and his culture. I was taught those traditions and culture. We went to a Hungarian-speaking church, although I couldn't speak Hungarian. I used to sit there and be bored for the entire hour until they started an English service. So my parents transitioned into English services. But I did all of the cultural things, the chicken paprikash, you know, the goulash, and all the Hungarian dishes, but also the Eastern European mentality. Work hard. My father and mother had a work ethic that was unparalleled. I picked up that work ethic, and I learned something about approval. To get approval from my parents, you had to work hard. You had to show yourself as being worthy of their approval. If you were lazy, my father would discount you totally. So I found myself working hard to try to gain his approval. And yet I learned something. I could never work hard enough. It seemed like I could never gain his approval. But when we're talking about the seat of one's emotion and character, your spirit, and being able to distinguish what's going on in that area of your life, this is the gift of the Holy Spirit. One of my prayers every morning is that the Holy Spirit would reveal to me the ways and the thoughts of the Father. The book of Isaiah tells us that His ways and His thoughts are not ours. 
So our thoughts and ways are foreign to God. Therefore, Holy Spirit, knowing the deep things of God, searches them out and reveals them to us. So my prayer is, Holy Spirit, reveal to me the ways and the thoughts of the Father today that you would make it real to my spirit as I pray in the Spirit. And I allow the Holy Spirit to receive from the Spirit of the, the, my Spirit to receive from the Holy Spirit the ways and thoughts of God. And then I ask Him, when you give me the ways and thoughts into my spirit, may my spirit make those ways and thoughts known to my natural mind so that I might live out daily with wisdom and revelation in your kingdom. Because I don't know how this works. I don't know how the kingdom works in the natural life. I can't, I can't, I can't understand it. I don't know how to apply it. What I do know from my background, many of my experiences were totally dysfunctional. So God, I need the Holy Spirit to be able to reveal thoughts and ways and wisdom with revelation every day, every moment of my life. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, let me give you an example in Acts chapter 16, verse 16 through 19. It was happening when Paul was going to prayer, a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination. He met them and brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. The girl followed Paul and cried out saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul became greatly annoyed and turned to the Spirit and said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. Now, I look at that scripture, and I understand it with the distinguishing of spirits that Paul, with his apostolic anointing, was able to discern that that girl, even though what she was saying sounded good, what she was saying is, listen to these men. They're the servants of God. They're preaching the way of salvation. But Paul rebuked that spirit and commanded it to come out of her and why did he do so? I believe that he did so because those words were inflating, could potentially inflate his own ego, make him feel that he was higher in his thinking about himself than he ought. And he realized in the moment of distinguishing of spirits, in the seat of his emotions and in the depth of his character that that was not God's script for him. Therefore, he had to take authority of that thought of those proclamations toward him and took authority over him and cast the enemy out. You see, distinguishing of spirits will help you to determine what comes in and where it goes, whether you should keep it or whether you should dismiss it. Distinguishing of spirits will also help us to give us a, an ability to communicate spiritually inspired messages to God. Further, it is God-given insight into the spirit world which gives a believer the ability to hear in the spirit realm, gives us the ability to see and hear in the spirit realm. Now, the Greek word is diakrisis. It is a Greek word which means discernment. It is the word that describes, uh, this Greek word describes discernment as distinguishing, discern, judge, appraise a person, statement, situation, or environment. And I want to just comment on that for a minute because the discerning of spirits, the seed of emotions, the character, discerning, judging, or appraising a person, statement, situation, or environment in the seat of emotion and in the character of that person. It gives us the ability to walk into a room and feel it. Yeah. To have a conversation with someone and to know what they're communicating beyond what they might be speaking. To have a relationship with someone and realize what the intent of that relationship is coming from that person towards you. 
It is the ability to distinguish, watch this, because this is the definition in the Greek, diacrisis. It means to appraise a person, a statement, a situation, or an environment. We have this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit to be able to live the God life after the likeness of Christ in every area of our life. Marriage, work, neighbors, relationships, parenting, every aspect of our life. Francis Frangipane, have you ever heard of Francis Frangipane? Francis comes to this church. This is what he said about discerning of spirits. Discerning of spirits is a gift given to men to see into the unseen. Its purpose is to see the nature of what is veiled. Now hold that up there for a minute because I want you to concentrate on it is to see the nature of what is veiled. To see the nature of what is veiled. Basically what it's saying is to see what you can't see behind the curtain. To see what God has planned for you but you can't see it because it's covered but yet God has already prepared it. But distinguishing of spirits, discernment of spirits, is the ability to pull the veil back, to pull the curtain back, and to see what God has prepared for your life. It's sort of like Hagar. Hagar was banned by Sarah, thrown out into the wilderness with her and Ishmael to die, literally to die. And she put her son under a tree, walked away a distance because she couldn't stand the suffering of a mother seeing her own son and child dying. And she went unto another tree, and the angel of the Lord asked her, what are you doing here? And she said, well, we're just going to sit out here and die. I've been banished, and this is the end of my life. This is the plight of my life. And, and God pulled the veil back. He pulled the veil back at a well that was not far from her, that had all the water that she would need for her and her son to live in this wilderness situation. But she had not seen the well because she was living the script that she had been handed, which was basically, you're going to be banished, you're going to die, and you're not going to live. And God said, no, I'm going to give you the distinguishing of spirits. I'm going to pull the veil back and let you see that you're going to live and not die. Do you follow what I'm saying? Now, it is apostolic. It is apostolic. It is important for us to understand the term apostolic, apostle, prophet, pa uh, ba pastor, evangelist, teacher. Fivefold ministry. How many are aware of the fivefold ministry, right? Okay, so if you're an apostle, you can be a, a prophet. You can be a pastor. You can be an evangelist. You can be a teacher. If you're a prophet, you can't be an apostle, but you can be a pastor, evangelist, and a teacher. If you're a pastor, you could be an evangelist and teacher. This is the beauty of Destiny Church. I'm submitting this to you, Pastor. You are not a pastor. He is an apostle. And the apostle is a person who unveils hidden things. An apostle is one who establishes foundation, who creates God's plan in the lives of others, in nations, in cities. It is apostolic. That's what Paul wrote in Ephesians 1.18. Read it now. The eyes, can we put it up there? The eyes of your understanding being enlightened. Everybody read it with me. Let's, let's read this verse together. It's open book test. It's real easy. Are we ready? I'm going to say read and we'll start. Read. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of his glory, of his inheritance to the saints. That you may know, that you may have knowledge, that you may have knowledge, distinguishing of spirits, is what makes knowledge available to you. But I believe it comes 
under an apostolic mantle. Now, that's really another message, but I just wanted to throw that out to you because you have to realize how distinguishing of spirits operates with the apostolic. But let's go to 2 Corinthians 2, verse 9. Paul writes this in the second letter to the church at Corinth. He says, But as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard. I think I got the wrong scripture. Uh, Neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God prepared for them that love him. Eyes have not seen, ears have not heard. All that God has prepared for you. Remember Elisha's servant when they were surrounded by the enemy? And he's like, oh, what are we going to do? There's so many of them. We're going to die. And God says, well, eye has not seen and ear has not heard all that the Father has prepared for you. So Elisha prayed, and what did he say? I want you to open his eyes. I want you to unveil the nature of the of, the, of, of, of his future. I want you to pull the curtain back and let him see what I prepared. When he opened his eyes, what did he see? He saw chariots of fire. He saw angels surrounding the enemy. When you're surrounded, God's got that which is surrounding you surrounded. And his eyes were open to it, and now he began to see the victory See, distinguishing of spirits will help you see the victory in a situation where there seems to be no way. The enemy will attack your soul. Your soul is the target. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. In our definition, God gives us the spiritual gift to distinguish in our soul Distinguishing of spirits, the seat of emotions, one's character. God gives us the ability to discern our own souls, to judge, to be made aware of, to gain knowledge of. Why do I think that way every time someone rejects me? Why do those thoughts come into my mind? Why do I feel so poorly about myself? See, we often live our lives day to day without any consciousness of the unconscious thought processes that move us, shape us, and create life for us. But as Christians, we now have been given the Holy Spirit and the gift of the discerning of spirits to find out where that seed of emotion has been impacted. We are often impacted from three areas of our life. There's more, but these three. Family of origin, culture, and relationships. These three sources often shape our lives. So here's here's the suggestion. You may have been born again. You gave your life to Jesus. You're learning the choruses. You're singing. You're worshiping. You cry when you worship. You love God. You read your Bible. You go to Christian events. But Grandpa still lives in your soul. Deuteronomy 5 and 9 talks about the sins of the generations, even down to the fourth generation, that impact us. They're like portals of holes or darkness that comes into our spirit. Someday I'll give you my testimony, or someday I'll give, write it down, I guess, but of my mother and father being married and having a sexual affair, and I was born. She got pregnant. She had two children at the time and a husband. He had a wife. They were living in a small coal mining town in Pennsylvania. Back then, 71 years ago, it was bad news for a woman to get pregnant outside of marriage, let alone to be married and get pregnant by her neighbor. It was a scandal. So my parents left in the middle of the night with $300 in their pocket and their car and took the two daughters and moved to Ohio. I was six months in the womb. 
Three months later, I was born. I was a happy little baby. I didn't know all this stuff. I didn't know they got it on over there in the neighborhood. I didn't know that. I didn't know half the family hated me and called me the devil's child. I had no idea I was a bastard. I was just a baby. Cute little baby. <laughs> but origin of family shaped me. The events that followed that shaped me, went into the seat of my emotions and my character. It is a source that the enemy used to get me off script. To get you off script is to send you to hell. But how many know it's not God's will that any man should perish? But all should have everlasting life. So when I was 21, an Hispanic woman by the name of Illyrio Gilbert, four foot two, looked up at me, handed me a track, and said, Jesus loves you. You need to read this. And I went, okay. <laughs> I went to work that night. I was working from 11 at night till 7 in the morning. I read that track, the little prayer on the back end of it. I was like, oh my gosh, I think I'm born again. This says I'm born again. I feel so good. I feel like I was walking above the ground. I could hardly wait to get home and tell my wife, Tina, what happened. Little did I know she had been given a book by Illyrio called Hear My Confession by a Catholic Priest. She read that book all night long, and at the back of it was a prayer, and she prayed. I walked in the door. I said, I think I'm saved. She goes, I think I'm saved too. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, we're both saved. I said, wow, this is amazing. What do we do now? I don't know, I guess we go to church. Where? We had no idea. Nobody in our family had ever been saved. So I had Jesus in my heart, but I had grandpa in my bones. Grandpa, he's a tough old fart, man. <laughs> he had to be cast out. How many know the enemy is a liar? Come on, say that with me. The enemy is a liar. Mm -hmm. He's a liar. Listen to this, John 8, 44. You belong to your father, the devil. You want to carry out the father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning not holding to the truth, for there's no truth in him. Say that with me. No truth in him. you got to get that in your spirit. There's no truth in the enemy. Not one fragment of truth in the devil. He is a liar. Watch what he says. When he lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. So what does he do? He blinds the minds, 2 Corinthians 4, 4. The God, the God of this age will blind the minds of those who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of the image of Christ. Ooh, this is so good. The glory of the image of Christ is what the enemy wants to blind your eye from. So he creates darkness, dark spots. My 17-year-old, I mean, 14-year-old uh, grandson, he's now 27. Um, his mother, which is my daughter, and his father had uh, made a mistake in high school. In other words, she got pregnant. And the father made my daughter prove that it was his baby. So they had to go through DNA testing and all this stuff. Found out it was, and he was not happy. So he moved to Florida. He had aspirations to become an NBA basketball player. 
He was very good. He was a star basketball player at the high school. Got hurt, went in the military, one situation after another. And he would bring my grandson for the summer for two months to be with him because my daughter lived in Ohio, he lived in Florida, so he would come to Florida for two months. And my grandson hated going there because he was rejected by his dad. His dad saw him as a mistake, as a problem, as an expense, child support. And his father had two other sons with his wife, and when my grandson would come to visit, he was the odd man out. One time, he was trying to get close to his father. This is now at 14 years of age. They were in a shoe store. Now, shoes are sort of like signatures for that age group. They, they're like, man, look at my shoes, man. These are, these are, these are like... These are like kicking it. These are hot. These are, these are boss. These are bad. <laughs> and it's funny, too. My grandson right now collects shoes. He, he has a collection of shoes that cost thousands of dollars. He buys them off eBay and sells them. And it's like a business. I don't know. I'm, they're just gym shoes to me, but to him. <laughs> but anyway, he's at a store, and he's trying to get close to his dad, and he walks up to his dad. He said, Dad, look at these these are awesome. These are boss, man. These are bad. These are like really cool shoes, Dad. What do you think? And he looked at me and goes, I ain't buying those blankety blank shoes for you. He said, Go ask your mother. Let her get the money that I pay for you for every month that I have to give her because of you. Ask her to buy you those blankety blank shoes. At that moment, a portal of darkness was opened and it went right into his spirit. He shrunk in to himself, became introverted, never told a soul how pained he was during that experience. What the enemy was doing is creating an environment that at the time he did not have the distinguishing of spirits to be able to judge that that environment was coming from the enemy. It was handed to him he tried out for the part, he absorbed the character, and he began to live it out. Until about a year ago, when God gave him revelation of allowing the word to shine on that part in his heart, to heal him and to change him. But it takes the distinguishing of spirits to be able to discern. If I sat down with Pastor and said, how are you doing, Pastor? This is amazing. And he looks at me and he went, he said, you need a breath mint. <laughs> I, I, I was not aware I had bad breath. When you're not aware of something, you cannot fix it. When I was made aware, I said, you got a breath mint? <laughs> and I popped it in my mouth, and voila, everything is going to be all right. <laughs> right? But if you're not aware that you're a selfish husband, and you're causing pain in your family and your wife, until you're made aware, you can't fix it. How do we become aware? It is the Holy Spirit who makes us aware. Listen to Ephesians 4, 22. I got to hurry. That regarding your previous way of life, you put off your old self completely, discard your former nature, which is being corrupted through deceitful desires. Be continually renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh, untarnished mental, spiritual attitude. And put on the new self, the regenerated, renewed nature created in God's image. God-like, created in God's image. So what was God's image for my grandson? That he's accepted, that he is gifted, that he is talented, 
that he has a future, that he has all of this ability. But what was the script that was handed to him by his father in that moment in the shoe store? You're rejected. You're worthless. I hate you. I wish you weren't my son. You have no future with me. There are the two scripts. Grandson, which one will you read? If he's handed the script that the negative side and begins to study for the character of that script and absorb that character, he will live his life with those characteristics the rest of his life until he realizes that that is coming from the family of origin, the distinguishing of spirits, and those are not Psalm 139 writings, the book that God has written about us. Those are not the writings of the Holy Spirit. And now he injects the Word of God, the likeness of God, the image of God into that situation and breaks down the script and rewrites it with God. There are some of us that need to rewrite the scripts because it is the likeness of God, not the likeness of your family, not the likeness of your culture. And what are we trying to do today? We are trying to create a generation. Culture is trying to infuse and impose its script upon our children. We have to help them. We do that with the gifts of the Spirit. I'm a firm believer that the gifts of the Spirit ought to be operating in the household like morning coffee. I mean, it's just normal. It's just normal. It's what we do here. We wake up in the morning and we say, hey, Dad, shun da la 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 ha da 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 I mean, we just, we just like, hey, what's up? I'm going over my friends, blah, 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 blah. See you later, Dad. I'm, Hey, Mom! Hey, Mom! Mom! Huh? Thus saith the Lord, when you walk in the laundry room this morning, ha, God's going to touch you. That's your 12-year-old, right? That ought to be normal. Look at your person next to you and say, that ought to be normal. Peter Cesaro says this, it's impossible to be spiritually mature while remaining emotionally immature. Remaining emotionally immature is living out a script that was not intended for you by God. That's emotional immaturity. And it's impossible to reach spiritual maturity when you're emotionally immature. So we follow either God's commandments or our family's commandments or our culture's commandments or relational commandments, and I don't have time to get into all that. But discerning of spirits identifies the source of thought and patterns and sinful behaviors, and we can bring the light. Arise, shine, for the light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you, and it breaks the back of the enemy. See, we have this internal conflict. We choose to follow Christ, but unconsciously we follow the commandments and rules we internalized from our family of origin, our culture, our relationships. I want to give you illustrations. I want to tell you about my family's bigotry. I'm embarrassed to even tell it. Prejudice. If you weren't Hungarian, you were trash. That's my dad and his thinking. If you were Hispanic or black, you were trash. It was, it was horrible. I was raised under that. It's an amazing thing to watch your family having a driveway installed. I was in fourth grade. My best friend was, was, uh, was black. He and I hung about out all together. We loved each other like brothers but they wouldn't let him come in the house. You can judge me if you want to. I'm just telling you how I was raised. My mother cooked lunch for the guys that were working. Most of them were black and Hispanic. Afterwards, like every day, we did dishes. 
We always did dishes. That was our job, do the dishes. We went to go do the dishes. My mom said, don't do them. I said, why? We're throwing those dishes away and threw them in the trash. I'm embarrassed to tell you that. But that's family of origin. You think, well, that's not the way I am. I am not that way. I have three grandsons that are African-American and white. I am not that way. But that teaching put its tentacles into my emotions and my character. That's just one example. My father was a drunk. He was an alcoholic. He was an angry man. He and my mother oftentimes would argue to the point of wanting to stab each other with knives. My father never told me he loved me until he died. Two minutes before he died at age 70, he was in intensive care and he grabbed my finger and said, I love you. And I got so angry at him, I yelled, I screamed, I ran out of the intensive care, I pushed over a cart, my brother tried to come to comfort me, I pushed him down, I screamed, went in the elevator and cried like a baby. It's stupid. The enemy is a liar. Come on, say it with me. The enemy is a liar. He's a liar, and he's lied to you, and he's lied to me because there's no perfect family. We all come from fallen, broken families. But thanks be to God. Woo! Jesus gives us new life. Amen? Woo! He gives us new life. I don't have to live like that anymore. So, I'm the devil, and you're Pastor Zach. Hey, Pastor Zach, I got a great script for you. I want you to read it, get to know it, absorb the character, and then play it out. Would you do that for me, Pastor Zach? You don't want my script. You need my script. Now, see, what he has to do is say, wait a minute, this is contrary to God's script. I, I'm, not, I'm not taking that. Ooh. I'm going to say, God, by the Holy Spirit, let's sit down and rewrite the script. Come on, somebody needs to lift up a hand and say, Father, rewrite the script. Come on, say it again. Father, rewrite the script. I'm going to close with this. When an actor is given a script, they have to decide whether they're going to be willing to take the part or not. Actors actually study for months to, to, to uh, read the script and learn it, but not only what they're going to say, but also the nuances of the character. For example, that includes accents. Many of these actors have to create an accent. Some of them study months, not only to uh, learn a uh, accent, but the culture, the mannerisms of that culture. For example, Robert De Niro moved to Sicily and lived there for months prior to filming The Godfather because he wanted to absorb the culture. Oh, Jesus. We're in this world, but we're not of this world. I refuse to absorb the culture of this world. I, I refuse to absorb the script of the enemy that says we're going to sit here and die. No, there's something unveiled right here that the Holy Spirit is going to show, that's veiled, that the Holy Spirit's going to show me that is going to be unveiled, whether it's a well of water or whether it's angels of fire around the enemy or whether it's a promised land that you're going to show me. I don't know what it is, God, but I know God is good all the time and God is good to me and I'm believing that through the distinguishing of spirits, I am going to see my future. The success, the success of the film depends on the actor staying in character. Some people stay in character their whole lives. Stay in character their whole life. They were taught 
They were given the script. They absorbed it. They now assume the character. They're living a false self. It's not even who you are. It's not who God meant you to be. You're living this false person. That's why deliverance is so powerful. I hate the devil. Because I know what he did to me. I know how he tormented me. I know how he abused me. I know how he's abused others and how he's tormenting people and he shouldn't get away with it because Jesus was nailed to a rugged cross and on the third day rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. Send the power of the Holy Spirit to deliver and to heal and to set free all that are oppressed of the devil. All families are broken and fallen. Joseph, 17 years of age, his brothers despised him, rejected him. I have to close because it's time for another service. But Pastor, I said I can go to 1145, so. I got notes from the office that said 1130. He said 1145. He the boss. <laughs> well, I'm going with him. Well, I got three minutes. 17 years of age. In one day, his life profoundly changed. He lost his parents. He lost his siblings. He lost his culture. He lost his food. He lost his language. He lost his freedom. He lost his hopes but he never lost his dreams. He had a profound sense of the bigness of God. My God is so big, he's so big, he's so big. My God is so big, he's so big, he's so big. My God is so big, he's so big, he's so big. The devil, he's so small, he's so small, he's so small. The devil, he's so small, he's so small, he's so small. The devil's so small, he's so small, he's so small. (laughs) Hey, you ever see people dance in church? They're like, you know what they're doing? They're dumping on the devil's head. And all that happened to Joseph, he ends up in Potiphar's house, and his wife goes ballistic, accuses him of sexual impropriety. He left his coat in her hands, went into prison, ends up with the keys to the prison, and doesn't walk out. Discernment of character, purposes of God. He has a dream. He speaks to Pharaoh. His brothers come for food. Ha ha, ha ha, I'm second in command. Woo, they're my brothers. Come on in, boys, come on in. I've been waiting for a long time for this. Come on in here, come on, sit down, sit down. I, I, if I was Joseph, they would have been toast. <laughs> Unless I had distinguishing of spirits and I realized that that character was not God's script. God's script for those boys is this. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So much so, he named his first son Manasseh. God has caused me to forget the hardship. And Ephraim, God has made me fruitful in my affliction. Take that devil. What the devil meant for evil. God. Turn for good. Come on.